Shabbat Shalom, Mishpacha, Pastor Norm here, Ascension Ministries. We are coming up to the fall feast. In fact, we're only five days away from Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. And the Feast of Trumpets is uh, when that is fulfilled prophetically at Yeshua's return. That speaks about the rapture of the church and the wrath of God. That's the great end time harvest that you see in Revelation 14, 14 through 20. And, and he comes and he reaps the church into, the, into his presence and throws the rest of them uh, into the, the unsaved, uh, the unrepentant, into the bowls of wrath. And boy, I just have to tell you, folks, um, what we're seeing right now, and I've shared this with you, is that we're seeing kind of a shadows and types and, and uh, mirrors of those things possibly unfolding, some things that are going to unfold prophetically, kind of mimicking um, events in the final uh, fall feast. And um, we are just, I mean, we're excited about this time. I know it's a little scary, but you got to remember that after we go through all this crisis and all this tribulation, the kingdom of God is waiting for us, and that's what we're pushing through to, um, not trying to save the world um, as far as the world system goes, but to win the world, the lost, uh, to Yeshua in the midst of all of that. And it's really good to... To, to know what's going on so you can explain it to people and then as it unfolds they have trust in your assessment of it and and that's why we have to come back to God's word on this thing and not man's doctrine and that's what we try to do here at, at Ascension um, I want to just mention some prophecy I'm going to get right into it uh, in this introduction because we're going to be watching a teaching uh, previous teaching that I did on the on the rapture of the church, uh, uh, the fall feast and the rapture of the church, but in before before I do that, I want to get into the prophecy in the news, because um, what we've seen is there, this just came out the other day. I think it was like Wednesday, and that uh, Trump was briefed on the real and specific threat of Iran to assassinate him. That's what his campaign said. In other words, in other words, the the Secret Service, yeah, whoever the National Security um, Agency (NCA), they came and and they came and briefed him. And basically, here was the summation in, in a sentence: "Is that Iran's quote? And I'm just saying, Iran's aim to assassinate Trump is part of an Islamic Repu the Islamic Republic's efforts to destabilize and sow chaos in the United States." And you remember that several weeks ago, September 14th, I, I talked about that. I said that's the, that's, there's five potential scenarios that could over, to overthrow America um, that could start unfolding in the 24, um, 2024 fall feast. And the first um, potential scenario is that the neo-globalists assassinate Trump, which throws the country into the phase three crisis. And you have to understand the spirit of the world is working in Iran and all of the globalists that are trying to bring this about one way or another, whether Donald Trump gets in as president or whether he doesn't, that's what their goal is. And so we have to be aware of who our enemy is, and that is the devil who is manipulating the nations against America because we are, us in Israel, are the last, two shining lights and if you just think about it that's who the devil's trying to destroy america and israel both and you can see that unfold every night on the on the news and then um you guys will remember some of you remember uh back in july of last year july 22nd last year i did uh part three of the biblical uh, roadmap to the return of christ I did a teaching on how the global currency reset and central bank digital currencies, that CBDCs, enslaved the world's financial system. And that was part three of our biblical roadmap to the return of Christ. And in that teaching, within that teaching, I talked about how 
In 2007, virtually 100% of all the trade that was, that was done was done in U.S. dollars because that's a reserve currency. When countries uh, do business with each other, they buy gold and they buy silver and, and oil or, or commodities, whatever the case may be, they would buy it in dollars. Um, and uh, that gave a standard price across the board around the world, and that came out of World War II. We have the 2007-2008 financial crisis, and immediately about 19 countries started to trade with each other using their own currency and, and other assets uh, to uh, conduct trade. And in that teaching, I talked about how the group of five, um, f the, these five economically aligned countries known as BRICS, and that is, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, is on the verge of uh, a massive expansion. And that, that's what their whole conference was that year, about in August. And uh, 13 other countries have actually asked to join BRICS in an effort to build a strategic alliance that will challenge the U.S. dollar's role as the world's reserve currency. And that was a big deal, and I said, that's, that's going to come back, and you're going to see that come back at that time. And then uh, Russia's state-owned news agency at that time, Sputnik, they said that BRICS is on the early stages of developing a new global currency that would circumvent the U.S. dollar. Um, and Russian officials say that it's going to be backed by gold and silver and additional resources. It's not. And I said at that time, they won't be able to do that with natural resources. And it won't do any good anyway, because there's no way you could put a value on that unless it was redeemable in those resources. And there's never going to be another redeemable a currency like there was gold before uh, they confiscated gold in 1933 here in America. Bottom line is this, they're going to take all those currencies, whoever joins that pack, and they're going to, and they're going to put them into a basket, and then they're going to average that, and that's what that, that will be, uh, that will be worth. That's their plan, and I'll, I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, the BRICS Currency Summit, that was the one last year in August of 2023 in South Africa, I said this, I said, is most probably going to launch a new currency pack that bypasses the United States dollar. Today, we have 20% of, of international trade is conducted in non-U.S. dollars. And so that, I, I say that because that's getting... Um, the world ready to move away from the dollar and into something else as a tradable commodity um, as far as a monetary unit. And that's exactly, um, that's what's going to happen. But the problem is this, is that even if they, when they do that, that unit, just like the U.S. dollar, is the value is going to go up and down based on its um, comparison to other currencies around the world. And so, and s there's still going to be fluctuations. Um, um, they're going to have to compete against each other in a slowing global economy, and that's just going to force the nations into a, a global currency war that will shape the financial markets, possibly even collapse them. But that is something, that's the third seal, and w I've been talking about that for a long time. That's what we're in, and that's just going to continually get worse and worse uh, until they collapse. And so I said all that to remind you that I said that because this year, this is a prelude to their conference um, this year. Um, this is a September 25th uh, report from the Nordic Times. That's a Scandinavian uh, newspaper. They, they declare themselves to be totally independent. So I have a pretty good feel for the, these guys. Anyway, um, it says this, quote, several leading analysts point out that a new international monetary system called UNIT, not the UNIT, just UNIT, is likely to un uh, be unveiled as early as the BRICS summit in Kazan, the capital of the Russian state, Tatarsan, in October. In other words, in October, they're going to reveal this, and it says here the headline is is that this new BRICS uh, currency could be in place as early as 2025. 
and that doesn't give us much time to get our financial house in order and so i just want to encourage you that um if you're looking to do some uh, financial rearranging i want you to go to goldstonemetals.com and check out our website that's not our website that's not essential ministries that's my personal website i'm helping people get financially kind of stabilized and get prepared for what's coming um, and then get on there get on the website send me a send me a, a, a message and let me know what you want to do if you're interested and give me your phone number I'll call you back okay that's all I'm gonna say about that and then lastly I just want to say this America is coming under judgment in part because they have turned against God's chosen people Israel um, we talked out of one side of our mouth, but in in the doing of it, we are we are weakening Israel at this uh, particular point in time and supporting Hamas. And you can just I bet you dollars to donuts now. Even if the U.S. gets in to help protect uh, Israel, they're still not going to allow Israel to go in and wipe them out. It's just uh, are th are they going to come against Israel if Israel tries to do that? But Israel has to do that. Um, for all the reasons why I shared in the teaching uh, some time ago on why, a real, uh, why Israel needs to totally destroy Hamas. And, um, and that's why we must support Israel in our wars against Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran. Um, we have to pray for them. We need to support them financially, which we do here at, Ascent, at, at Ascension Ministries. And, and to, to, to be there to support them. Because the Lord says, I will bless those who bless you and I curse those who curse you. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May prosperity be in your palaces. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you folks, it's, I mean, it's the time. It's the end of the age. And we're seeing all the prophetic things come to pass. And that's why I want to encourage you to follow us on YouTube and Rumble, those are the two um, platforms that we are on. And and you say, well, Norm, I just wish you'd talk more about what you just talked about and all the things that are going on. Well, there's a billion people out there that are talking about it, but a lot of it is just speculation, a human assumption and speculation and 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 overabundance of conspiracy theory. And there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are true, but there's a lot of them that aren't. And the only way we really know for sure is if we come back to the Word of God. And that's what we do here at Ascension. But not only that, we try to help show you from the Word, based on what's going on in the world, what's coming in the future, and what God says to do about it. And I don't know any of the, of the talking heads out there on the radio or on anything that um uh, that are doing that <laughs> i remember when i first got into video broadcasting <laughs> one one consultant that i was talking to he said he said you need to be on the radio <laughs> and, and i and i thought yeah i know most people think i have a face for radio but the bottom line is is that i can't show you powerpoints on on the radio and and if we I'm such a visual guy, and I'd like people to be able to see what the Word is, kind of a visual of what the Word is, is, is talking about. And uh, we've got so many lights on that as far as people liking that. And I hope that, I hope that you guys do. Last week, I talked about part one. Um, is there a rapture of the church? And if so, when is there? Part one was, is there a rapture of the church? And we answered it. Yes, there is a rapture of the church. It's found in both the Old and New Testament, the Torah and the prophets and the apostolic writings. And we, we learn how the scriptures describe God's people being both gathered to him and then coming back with him. And, and I'm just giving you some bullet points here. And if you didn't see last week, go back and watch it. I mean, if you ever wondered if there was a, if there was a rapture of the church, last week's message will answer it for you. And I'm going to review some of that today um, in the teaching. And I talked about how the two witnesses of Revelation 11, uh, they come and they prophesy under the anointings of Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets, and the law and the prophets tell us that Jesus is the Messiah. We talked, I talked a little bit about it. I just touched on how, the, how, the, how a false rapture plays a major role in creating the strong delusion. 
And and that's something that if you didn't see that whole thing about the UFO, that series I did about the UFOs uh, back um, late last year and, and early this year, I want to encourage you to go back and watch that. Because that's, I believe with all my heart, that's that something along those lines is what's going to take place. And I don't want you to be deceived. And then we talked about how the 40 days of Teshuvah ends with the rapture of the church on what's called the day that no man knows. And right out of the shoot, we got comments on YouTube, <laughs> which is good. I mean, we like comments on YouTube. But here's Mr. Emerald Dog. He says, he says this. Yes, there is a rapture. It is pre-tribulation. And we don't know, uh, don't know exactly the time the Lord will come. It's actually simple. Please don't stir, uh, stir the pot. Um, <laughs> and, and it's like, well, stirring the pot. Well, I mean, good company because the prophets and Jesus himself and the apostles, all they did was stir the pot. Um, they, were, they stirred that religious pot and all of man's religion and, and all of his man-made doctrine. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. I, and I don't want to bring to you a man-made doctrine. I want to show you in the scriptures on the shadows and types and patterns of God and then and then direct scripture verses that fit into all of that to show you when, where, how, and why God's doing certain things the way he is. Because it's all right there. If we just study to show ourselves approved, then, then we can be that workman who rightly divides the word of truth, and that's all I'm trying to do. And then here comes, here comes um, uh, Ye M J S. Um, a VMJS, <laughs> and and he or she, whoever that is, I don't know, um, are defending the the position I was holding, um, and they said, no, we don't know the day or the hour, but Scripture reveals the time, a time marker. That's right, and the time marker is the fall feast. The time marker is the rapture of the church. That's when we gather to him um, at at um, the feast of trumpets, and then Yom Kippur which is when he returns, we come with him. And I'm going to go through, I'm going to start into that uh, this week. Remember, uh, the dead rise first. We get caught up after. It's even simpler to figure out than you think. <laughs> I thought that was really a good comeback. So I, I want to thank both of them uh, for their comments because I, mem I remember I was an avid pre-turber. And folks, I have to tell you, you couldn't talk me out of nothing. It was only God that got a hold of me and started showing me the sequence of events and the timing of events in the in the spring feast, and he said, "Now, if if that's uh, if that's what happened in the spring feast to 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 identify when I was coming, what I was going to do, and 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 so on, what that meant, then the fall feast are going to talk about my return, when I'm coming, how I'm going to do it, what's going to happen, where that's at in scripture." And that's what we've unfolded to you, gosh, for over 20 years now. And this is really important that we get this down in us because the deception in the days ahead is going to be so broad and so deep. And, and just like William Casey, the head of the CIA, said that we'll know that our disinformation plan uh, worked when, when nobody knows what to believe. <laughs> Um, in America, and and the bottom line is they're they're bringing us there now. Just look what's going on in the news, and so I'm I'm going to stop right there um, with the review, and what I want to do is I want to I want you to I want you to listen to this teaching now, because uh, this is what I did. This is last year's teaching that I did on Rosh Hashanah, and the Feast of Trumpets and the Rapture of the Church, and and I laid it out on the timeline. And to show you all the events that are happening and how er all the scriptures relate to it and what they mean. They give you understanding. Scriptures you've read before, it's, they're going to have new meaning to it. Some of you have seen this. Some of you haven't. Those of you that haven't seen it, you'll be blessed. Those of you who have seen it, watch it again because you need that refresher course. Every year I refresh myself in the feast. And that's why the Lord says we're to, we're to celebrate them Every year as they repeat to remind us of all the things the Lord has done and all the things that he's going to do when he comes again. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Father, we just thank you for this teaching. God, we ask you to bless it. Help the people to understand, Lord God. Um, encourage us in your spirit, Lord God. 
and, and, and touch our mind with your mind, Lord God, that we might understand the times and know what to do. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Let's watch the teaching. Shalom, everyone. Welcome to the Elijah Report. Norm France here, pastor of Ascension Ministries. Um, the Elijah Report is our prophetic outreach to help God's people understand the times and know what to do. We try to flow the best we can under two primary anointings. One is the Elijah anointing, the spirit of Elijah, that, that gifting and that anointing of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. And uh, the Issachar uh, anointing uh, that helps us to understand the times like the sons of Issachar and then know what to do. And so, Father, we just pray right now that, that those two anointings be upon this teaching because it is so important for understanding the last days and what is happening now and what is to come in the future based on your word, Lord. Not our doctrine, not our pastor's doctrine, but on your word. Help us, Lord, to see what you are doing from the scriptures in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. And because I have a lot of teaching to do today, I just want to say one thing. I want to clarify some things that I talked about last week. First of all, um, I didn't mean, I don't mean to offend any pre-tribbers, only because I'm, I was an avid pre-tribber, and I t already told you that, until the Lord began to show me a, a little bit broader understanding of his word, rather than just my pre-tribulation doctrine. And, and I just want to say that, that, that God had mercy on me, and he gave me grace to get through it, and I just... I didn't feel like I showed as much grace last week to the pre-tribbers, and for that I just apologize, um, because I know that when I was going through that, it was I was honest and sincere, and I loved the Lord, and I just wanted to see Him coming, which there's a reward for those who, um, there's actually a crown that uh, for those who love his appearing, amen? <laughs> so so whether we're, you're right or whether you're wrong on that or anybody, uh, if we love his appearing, there's a crown that we're going to receive as one of our eternal rewards that we get to live with the rest of our, the, well, throughout eternity. And so um, I just encourage you to, to, to keep that zeal but let's get back to the Word of God and let's really zero in and really drill down on what he's talking about when he talks about the day that no man knows. Um, and then also last week, it, as I was listening to the, the, the teaching again, um, just going over, because I try to critique everything that I, that I do the week before so I can make corrections or whatever the next week. Um, I just feel like I was I wasn't clear it almost it almost sounded like I was saying that uh Rosh Hashanah or and Yam Tupu, uh Yam uh Tarua were um were next uh Saturday the 23rd that that isn't what I was saying what I was saying was is there were those that were prophesying it's next Saturday on the 23rd and then there was one guy who said it was the 15th which was yesterday and I'll maybe explain a little bit why he thought that. Um, but I just want to say that um, I prophesied last week that Yeshua wasn't coming today. Okay, He wasn't coming on the 23rd, which means, and he's not coming today. He's not coming on the 23rd. And I know some of you feel like, well, you're setting dates by doing that. No, I'm not. I'm just saying it's not coming. He's not coming on that date. I'm not setting a date. Um, he's coming on the day that no man knows, but that's not just an any minute type of rapture. That is on a, that is a, an, in a specific timeline that I'm that I'm hopefully going to be showing you here uh, this week. So if you're if you're a pre-tribber and you you're offended by what I teach as emphatically, um, I just want to encourage you. Um, Try to try to just listen to what's being said from the scriptures, and understand it from a Hebraic mindset, a biblical mindset, versus a a 20th century Anglo-Saxon Gentile mindset, Greco-Roman mindset 
uh, that most of the church has been taught, you know, for centuries now. And so we want to come back to the whole counsel of God and understand it from the culture in which it was written, which is the Jewish culture, the Hebraic culture. And that doesn't mean that everything that's, quote, Jewish is biblical, but we have to get back to um, a greater understanding of what some of the Hebraisms and, and, and the whole counsel of God are talking about. So I hope you'll bear with me um, on that. And, um, and at, least, at least up to this point, I've been right where the rapture hasn't taken place yet. Um, and, you'll, and you'll understand why I'm, why I'm emphatic about that, okay? All right, let's go. Um, last week, this is going to be a quick review because I have a lot to teach this week. Um, we put out the most popular uh, premillennial timeline that most people will, will, will gravitate toward. Most of your uh, futurist um, um, premillennial uh, believers uh, hold to, and that is the seven-year tribulation, the, the, the birth pain sum at the end of the church age, and that goes into the seven-year tribulation. That's when the Antichrist signs the peace treaty. In the middle of the tribulation is when he sets himself up as being God, and that's the abomination of desolation, followed by the second coming at the end of the seven-year tribulation, and that's when we go into the millennial reign of Messiah. And then the, the rapture, the catching up of the church, is um, the, the pre-trib is right at the beginning um, of the seven-year tribulation, and some people b honestly believe, and honestly believe that that was this weekend. And there's there's more people that believe it's going to come next weekend. But next weekend is just you're right in the middle of the ten days of awe, and so there's really no significance about about that date as far as the day that no man knows. Um, <clears throat> And so then the mid-trib is in the middle of the seven years, and then the post-trib is at the end, but there's another one, pre-wrath. And I took, I took the pre-mid and post-tribulation um, rapture, and I put it over onto my, uh, my chart of the global transitions into the mystery of Babylon. It's actually the global transitions. This is part of the biblical roadmap to the return of Christ that we're, we're going through that series right now. Um, I put that in where the, where the global meltdown is now, and that's where we're going from this world order into the new world order. And the pre-trib uh, people that are prophesying it's going to happen now or s speculating, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, happen now, that would happen here very, very soon. That would be a pre-trib. Mid-trib would be at the end um, as we transfer from the uh, New World Order into uh, when the Antichrist comes up um, into the middle of his, in, in the middle of his reign. That would be your mid-trib. And then post-trib is at the end <coughs> where people just believe that the resurrection of the dead and the righteous that are still alive happen at the coming of the Messiah. They don't really go anywhere. And um, um, and so I just I, I don't believe that any of those are, are 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 what should I say I don't believe that any of those can be borne out totally in the whole counsel of God. Um, and so uh, we we're dealing with a pre wrath rapture that's based on the fall feast, and I and I base this on the premise that if if Yeshua fulfilled the spring feast at his first coming, in other words, on Abib 14, he died on the cross on Passover as the Passover lamb. Um, on, from the 15th to the 22nd, he was, in, well, he was in the grave the first three days after that, but from the 15th to the 22nd, is unleavened bread, and that talks about, you know, Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 7, don't you know that you're unleavened? Okay, and, and so we're called to be unleavened and walk not in sin, the transgression of God's law, but to walk in righteousness, which is in obedience to the, to, to the laws of God. 
and and then three days later was first fruits and that's when Yeshua rose from the dead well he rose from the dead and then he ascended into heaven the first time um, on the feast of first fruits at the nine o'clock first fruits offering um, on the feast of first fruits and he fulfilled that by becoming the first fruits from among the dead that's why he's called the first fruits from among the dead and and then 50 days later, of course, we know that, that, that the Holy Spirit came and, and filled the body of Messiah in the power of the Holy Spirit. They baptized him in the power of the Holy Spirit. But the first Pentecost was at Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments. And that's when, that's when Israel said, No, Moses, you speak to us, lest we die. Uh, God was trying to fill them at that time <clears throat> with the Holy Spirit and write the Torah on the heart, but they said no, and then they turned to man to hear to hear God's voice. God restored that. He he brought all of that back and empowered the church on the second watershed Pentecost, fifty days after Yeshua uh, ascended, and and so we just have to we have to understand that just as he fulfilled those um the his first coming during those feasts okay or fulfilled those feasts at his first coming he's going to fulfill the fall feast at his second coming and and tishri one is the end time harvest that's the harvest of the wheat and the tares when god harvests both at the same time and i'm i'm going to try to get to that today um yom kippur is about his physical return and then Sukkot is the marriage uh, of the Lamb. <clears throat> and, um, um, and I'm going to go through all of those so we can understand and be excited about coming into a greater revelation uh, of what God is saying about the last days and His coming and then what we need to do in preparation for that. Because if you're just waiting for the rapture but you're not preparing yourself, um, as a people made ready for the Lord, I want to tell you, you're going to get surprised at the at, at that on that day, and you'll see that as we go through this here, um, in the next little while. Um, we we did this by um, doing the um, talking about God's calendars that govern set times. We have the civil calendar and we have the sacred calendar. The civil calendar uh, measured linear time, and the sacred calendar measures the uh, the feast, the timing of the feast. And then we talked about the the connection between Tishri one on the civil calendar and Tishri one on the sacred calendar. One is the first day of the first month on the civil calendar. The other one is the the first day of the seventh month on the sacred calendar. And there's a real, there's a, there's a big purpose that so we have to understand that because on the civil calendar, when you see that governs the linear time from the very beginning to the very end of the millennium, the thousand year millennium, that, that measures that linear time. The civil calendar, again, let me just reiterate, the civil calendar measures the linear time from the very beginning of creation to the white throne judgment at the end of the thousand years. That's what that calendar measures. But then there's the, fall, there's the sacred calendar that, that governs the cyclical uh, yearly feast annually. And you have the spring feast and then the fall feast, and then those spring feasts, which is when Yeshua came the first time at Passover, they cycle every year and they move down that, that linear timeline until, until the, the Tishri 1 on the civil calendar and Tishri 1 on the sacred calendar, they meet. And that is the day that no man knows on Tishri 1. And you'll understand why that's called the day that no man knows as we go through this teaching. Most of you know that, but there's a lot of new people watching out there. And, 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 and this is really going to help you understand why this is this is undoubtedly not a pre-trib rapture and I, and I don't and I don't again I don't want to offend people I just want you to understand I'm trying to bring you a, a as a former pre-tribber I'm trying to bring you a greater understanding that will just really make clear 
and set you on a different course um, in your walk with the Lord, it's a much better course because, because in that respect, we're preparing ourselves for the coming of the Lord rather than just sitting around waiting for the rapture. Does, I hope everybody will receive that from me. And when those two days meet, that, that is the day that Yeshua is released to come and return for his church. And that day in the, in the Jewish community for centuries has been known as the day that no man knows, the day that no one knows. And here's what I'm saying. Here's what I believe that this teaches, is that on the first, Tishri 1, in the first month of the civil calendar, that's Rosh Hashanah, that measures, that counts each year of God's creation and sets the year of Messiah's return for his church. Tishri 1 in the seventh month, which is the sacred calendar, is Yom Teruah, and that celebrates the appointed day of Messiah's return for his church. And that, that's one reason why it's called the day that no man knows. Um, and the other reason is, I'll explain as we get into it, because it'll make, it'll make uh, more uh, sense, you'll understand it better as we get a little further into the teaching so you understand why they call it that. Um, but having said that, we are... This is uh, Rosh Hashanah. This is the first of Tishri. If you look on the uh, biblical calendar, or the Jewish calendar, if you're a partner, you, you got that in the mail. You've got that hopefully in front of you. And you'll see that today is, um, is Yom Teruah. Today is Rosh Hashanah, the civil new year, and Yom Teruah on the sacred calendar. And this is the day traditionally now from the, from the Jewish perspective, and that's gotten over into the Christian teaching. This is the day that the people that are raptured, the people that are saved and, and are not going to ever lose their salvation or anything like that, um, they are inscribed permanently in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen? And that's why we meet and greet each other on Rosh Hashanah um, and and Yom Teruah, and we say, may you be inscribed in the book of life. And, and that's what the Jews um, today are saying, may you be inscribed in the book of life. And that's when people are written, their name is written in the book of life, those who, uh, those who are saved and going to heaven, okay? Now, that was, that was part one that we did last week. This week, we're doing part two of this, uh, the, from the rapture to the return, prophetic interpretation of the fall feast. Um, and, and for that, we have to understand the 40 days that surround Teshuvah, the, 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 I should say um, Yom Teruah, which is the, the 40 days of Teshuvah, or the 40 days of repentance that started a month ago in Lul. And I mentioned that back then, and that that was the time that we were preparing for the Lord's coming. I'm going to reiterate that because this is so important that we get this down. <clears throat> and I guess one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about, about the rapture not taking place this year, either this weekend or next weekend or any time during the fall feast, is that the church isn't ready. It just is not ready to meet the Lord. Um, and so when we go back to Elul 1, that begins the teshuvah, the repent and the season of repent and return. And that goes all the way to Tishri 10, which is, the, uh, which is Yom Kippur. And the reason that this is called teshuvah, it's also called the season of God's favor. The season of God's favor has to do with um, now, now this is what Judaism teaches, and this comes w from way back during Moses' time, okay? Is that Moses ascended the mountain for the third time to seek the forgiveness, God's forgiveness for Israel for the sin at, of the golden calf on the first of Elul. He was up there for 40 days. Israel's been teaching this forever, for, for millennia. And, and then he descended on the 10th of Tishri, which is Yom Kippur, and then he announced and, and told them 
that God has forgiven you. Now, what is Yom Kippur about, the Day of Atonement? It's about the forgiveness of sin, is that right? That's about where, it's, where everything is just wiped away. But it's also about judgment. Because during, from, from Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the 10 days between now and Yom Kippur, on that, on, during that time of Messiah's coming at the end of the age, there's, there's, there's time where people can still repent between the rapture and the, and the wrath of God. And so the judgment, but the judgment in the end comes on the 10th. And in the Jewish circles, that is when they celebrate today, they start that time of heavy duty repentance because on the 10th of, of Tishri, on the Day of Atonement, God says, yes, not only are you, are you inscribed in it, but you're sealed in the book of life. Okay? So there's that 10 days of final repentance, of searching ourselves and, and, and clearing up everything with the Lord and coming into his presence and, and uh, just seeking him with our whole heart. It's just a, it's just a time of, of, of just a supernatural drawing to the Lord during that time because nobody's doing this thing perfectly. Certainly not me. If you don't ask me, just, just ask my wife. She'll tell you. Um, and so the bottom line is this, is that I, but I want to be ready when I hear that trump, amen? I hope you do too. Um, so during this 40 days of repentance, this, these are the trumpets of Elul. This is, this is the, uh, during the month of Elul, there's trumpets that are sounded every day. This was in the temple in ancient times, sounded every day except on tradition says, except for on Shabbat. And that was to announce that the king is coming on Yom Teruah to judge the earth. Prepare yourself. Prepare, prepare, prepare. And the bottom line is this, is that this is the time as we approach the end of the age, as we are in the end of the age and, and, and the coming of Messiah, when we're, at, when we're approaching that, we need, to, we need to come back and we need to say, okay, God's coming to judge. I need to come back to him. And please hear me, the, those birth pains are starting to pick up speed. I hope everybody sees that. Okay, out there in the world, it's picking up speed, and it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse as we go down this timeline. Now, these trumpets, this is the, these are the trumpets that Joel talks about this trumpet. This is the, the trumpets of Elul symbolize Joel's warning trumpet that the day of the Lord is near. Joel 2, beginning in verse 3, says, Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. And that's and the warnings that you hear of people saying, you know, judgment's coming, get ready, get ready, get ready. Those are in that spirit of, of, of the trumpets of Elul, that are saying, get ready, here comes the Lord, his drawing is coming near, be ready. And it's just a, it's a repeat, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. And so we can't stand before the Lord and say, well, Lord, I didn't know. Because there's a lot of people out there that are talking about God's judgment. Yeah. Isaiah 40, this is the voice, this is the, the, the prophet's primary message was not to prophesy over people or teach them how to prophesy. That's, that's part of the gift of prophecy, and every believer can do it. But the prophets called, the message was to call people to repent and come back to God's Torah, his teaching and his instruction. And when I say Torah, in large part, I'm talking about the whole counsel of God from the book of Revelation to the end of the, of, of the book, of the, to the end of Revelation. Um, because it's all God's teaching and God's instruction, okay? Um, technically, it's the first five books of the Bible, but everything has to relate back to what's being said back there in order to be proper doctrine. And I've already talked about that. Um, you'll just have to go in and listen to some of the tapes. Get on our, um, get on our website, and, and you can listen to the downloads of the audios in there on, on that. <clears throat> um, in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, it says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That, that just means that you know, we're going to straighten everything out. 
If we apply God's laws in our life, it straightens everything out. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places made shall be made straight, and the, and the rough places smooth. In other words, when you apply the Torah, and you walk in it, all of the valleys, they rise up so you got a level playing field. All the mountains, they come down so you got a level playing field. The road, the crooked road, it straightens out as we walk in the Torah. <clears throat> And then, now listen to this, verse 5. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. God's glory is not going to be revealed and restored to the church until we come back to his whole word. Amen. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Yeah. See, that's what the cry of the prophets is. Malachi, here's Malachi says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. What, what, what's his message? His message is from the days of your fathers. This is talking about the rebellious fathers that came out of Egypt, because there's two sets of fathers, and you'll see that here in a minute. From the days of your fathers, the rebellious fathers that came out of Egypt, you have turned aside from my statutes, and you have not kept them. In other words, You've broken my Torah. You've walked away from all my laws that, that, that incorporate the statutes, the ordinances, the precepts, and so on and so forth of God, the commandments. Um, and he's saying, hey, return to me. Come back. From the days of your father, because that's what it says there in the last part of that, verse 7 says, and I will, he says, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. From the days of your fathers, now hear me, this is so important that we get this down in us. You have turned away from my statutes. We have to come back to the way of the Lord. What is the message when we turn back to the statutes? What, why is that? Malachi, in, in chapter 4 now, Malachi, he brings it all, the whole, the whole chapter of Malachi comes together, what he's talking about, in chapter 4. And the first thing out of his mouth is talking about the day of the Lord. For behold, the day is coming. This is talking about the day of the Lord. Burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And that day... <clears throat> And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. That's talking about the day of the Lord. Then verse 4 says this. This is the message of Elijah. Remember the law of Moses, the Torah of Moses, which is the law of God. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and the ordinances which I commanded him in Oreb for all Israel. In other words, in other words, the Lord is saying, the day of the Lord is coming. And so what you need to do is you need to come back and understand the law of Moses. He says, behold, and who's going to bring that message? It's Elijah. The, and I'm talking about the spirit, the anointing of Elijah. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. In other words, that message of repent and come back to Torah is going to be in the earth being preached before, just before Messiah comes. And, and I don't know about you, but I've been, I've been preaching it for, what, 30 years? Those of you who have been with me that long? There's some of you out there, some of you old-timers. <laughs> You're still kicking. I'm so glad. And the bottom line is this, folks, is that, is that Malachi here is telling us that in the last day, before the fire of God comes, before that final judgment comes, the spirit of Elijah, that anointing of Elijah, is going to go out. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to say, come back and walk in the law of Moses so that you don't experience the judgment at the end of the age. And you'll see that as we move forward. And he says, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. Yeah, the prophet Elijah. 
before the great and terrible day of the Lord. See, the, 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 what it's talking about here is this is the two witnesses. This is Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. And the law and the prophets testify throughout it from Genesis through Malachi, those very last verses of Malachi that we're going through. That Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. He is God come in the flesh. That's what it's all about. But it's about just more than that. It gives us the understanding of the times that we're in and the, and the, and the desperate need we have to prepare ourselves so that we are made ready for him at his return. Yeah. That's what the, that's what the Old Testament's about. See, they missed that time of visitation at Messiah's first coming. Um, um, and, and we'll see that here in a minute. But he goes on in Malachi to say, <clears throat> and he, Elijah, talking about the spirit of Elijah, will restore the hearts of the fathers, and that's not the disobedient fathers, that's the fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to their children, and their children are the disobedient sons, the rebellious fathers that came out of Egypt that I just mentioned in the previous chapter. I hope everybody can see that. And the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And we see that, and, and I just want to say this, one of the greatest signs of Messiah's first coming was John the Baptist. And Luke 1, beginning in verse 16, says, <clears throat> And he, talking about John the Baptist, will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. In other words, it's the same spirit turning those who are disobedient and <clears throat> away from God's word. God is going to turn or, um, Elijah, that spirit of Elijah, is going to return them back to it. What was John's major message? Repent, return. And see, this is the season of repentance. And that's why this message is so important that we get this down in us. But the whole year is a, is a, is, should be a year of turning to the Lord. Every single day, more and more and more. Verse 17 says, And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. See, one of the greatest signs of Messiah's first coming was John the Baptist who went in the spirit of Elijah to turn what? And he quotes right out of Malachi, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And then he stops the direct quote there, and, he's, and, he, and he clarifies who's coming back, um, whose hearts we're talking about. The fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob versus the rebellious fathers who walked away from the Lord. So the hearts of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that had a heart for Torah and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. In other words, he's calling people to repent and come back to the laws of God. So as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. See, if we're not actively trying to understand what God says uh, to us and has been saying all this time from the law and the prophets and the writings, we're never going to understand the full message of the gospel because it's more than just D Jesus dying on the cross for the forgiveness of sin. That's the, that's the beginning of it. That opens the door and you step into the kingdom. But now we need to walk the kingdom way as kingdom children. And that's what the Torah helps us to do. That's what, that's what the Old Testament helps us to do in combination with the New Testament and vice versa. This is also traditionally a time when the king, when it's said that the king is in the field and he's inspecting what he's out there doing is he's looking, he's inspecting the harvest to see, um, um, see if it's ready. Because this is the time when the, when the trumpets are blowing and saying, hey, he's out in the field. He's getting ready to harvest. And, and this is a really good caption. I've shared this before. The king is in the field. Where are you? Are you in the field? Are you in the field getting ripened? And, and this picture right here is really a good illustration of where the field's at. Because the scripture talks about the fields are white with harvest. Um, right across the road over here, they just harvested uh, the wheat crop. <laughs> 
And I mean, it was snow white. I, and I didn't get a picture of it. I was going to, and the day I was going to go up and take a picture, they it was already harvested. <laughs> so all it is now is stubble. But the bottom line is, is that this this uh, field of wheat is still green. It's not ready yet. And he's out there and he's looking, okay, it's not ready yet, so I can't come yet. That's one reason why I, I know, I knew that Yeshua wasn't coming today and he's not coming next week. Okay? I don't know when he's coming exactly, except I know it's, it's not this day or this, this week. The church isn't ready. Now, <clears throat> why is this called a day that no man knows? I know some of you, some of you already know. Some of you are going, okay, would you stop talking about it and just tell us? Okay, here we go. Um, Yom Teruah is the only biblical feast that is set on the first day of a biblical month of the, on the lunar calendar. Um, <clears throat> which begins with the sighting of the new moon for that month, okay? Now, the, I'll, 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 <sighs> there's so much. It's just, I just want to give it to you. I wish I could just download it in you, but I can't. So hang in there. Bear with me. In ancient times, it was impossible to predetermine the exact day or hour when the moon appeared to start, um, appeared to start Yom Teruah so that the, so it was called the day that no man knows. In other words, the new moon begins on the first of Tishri, but they didn't know exactly when. In fact, it's even hard to tell um, when it is this time. And so they would observe, Israel observed Yom Teruah for two days. So sometimes it came on the, that first day of the month. Sometimes it didn't show up till the second day on the, on the biblical calendar. And if you look at if you look at your biblical calendar, it's right here, you'll see that the Feast of Trumpets is a two-day celebration. There's day one and day two, okay? Um, and that's important to, that we understand that because, because um, there's a reason for that. And in ancient Israel, <clears throat> at the end of Elul, right around between the 29th and the section of Tishri, they would put somebody, they would put two witnesses uh, they were watchmen priests um, on the wall of the temple who looked for the new moon uh, of Tishri 1, which began Yom Teruah. When the new moon of Tishri 1 appeared, they sanctified it with a long, loud blast of the shofar so everyone would know that the high Sabbath of Yom Teruah had started. Yeah. When this trump sounded, now listen to this. When this trump sounded, now this is what happened in Israel, in ancient Israel. When this trump sounded, the faithful believers in Yahweh immediately arose and headed up to the temple while the unfaithful just kept working. The imagery, Yeshua sets forth this imagery of the rapture of the church um, in the in, uh, of um, on Yom Teruah, he didn't do it on Yom Teruah, but he was telling us about it. Uh, where where two people, one faithful and one unfaithful, are working in the field, and or grinding at the mill. When the trumpet sounded, the faithful who hurried up to the temple symbolized those who were taken, while the unfaithful who just kept working symbolize those who were left. And, and this is an important thing that I want to make note of here, that I want to get in on this, on this teaching. And that is, in ancient times, <coughs> on Yom Teruah, um, the temple doors were only open for a certain period of time, and then they would be shut. And that symbolized in the ten virgins who the, the five wives, they, they were ready and they went in to the marriage. And, and the five unwise, they had to go get oil and then they came and they knocked on the, on the temple door and they said, Lord, let us, let us in. And he said, the, the, the doors were shut. And he said, I never knew you. 
and so this is all symbolic of what happens um, on Yom Teruah, which is the day no man knows, um, um, on the Feast of Trumpets. I'll tell you, folks, this is so clearly laid out in the scriptures that, I mean, you have to be blind in one eye and can't see out of the other not to see it. All right, now we're going to start talking about the actual rapture of the church. <coughs> On, uh, during the month of Elul, there's a daily reading that was read in the temple of Psalms 27. And that psalm, there are two passages of scripture in that psalm <coughs> that, that shows evidence of God taking his people up into his presence before the wrath. And that's found in Psalms 27, 5, where it says, for, the, for in the day of trouble, that's talking about the day of wrath, he will conceal me in his tabernacle, <clears throat> in the secret place of his tent. He will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And then verse 10 also is very clear. I think I see it. Um, it says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. And this is more than just a divine protection through the tribulation. This actually, um, in the Hebrew, that shows a divine extraction, uh, a taking out, a taking up, and removing from the situation. And, and the thing we have to understand is, is that the, 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 the rapture of the church or the translation, the catching up of the church, is not just in the New Testament. That's not a New Testament doctrine. <clears throat> That's an Old Testament doctrine that Paul just brought revelation to understanding. And you'll say, well, Norm, I need one more witness out of the Old Testament or the prophets in the, in, from the, from the uh, Law and the Prophets. Okay, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 26. He prophesies that, that God takes both the living and the dead up into his tabernacle before, the, before he pours out his wrath. Um, Isaiah 26, beginning in verse 19, um, Isaiah says this, Your dead will live, your corpses will rise, you who lie in the dust, awake, and shout for joy, for, the dew, for, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth gives, will give birth to departed spirits. And remember, this is that time where those trumpets of Elul are sounding, saying, wake up, wake up. Two weeks ago and three weeks ago, we did that two-part series on why the church needs to get woke. Not woke the way the world is getting woke, which is totally ungodly, but getting woke according to what God says to wake up, and that's wake up to him and his ways. Hallelujah. And his ways are laid out in the Torah, even <clears throat> at Torah and the prophets, even in the book of Isaiah and the book of Psalms, it talks about the rapture of the church. And you say, well, Norm, it doesn't say anything about, about me being raptured uh, alive and, and those who are alive. Well, let's keep going. And verse 20 says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while while indignation runs its course. In other words, while, while all of that that's going on, while God pours it out, he's going to hide the dead who are, who are, that he raises at that time in his tabernacle. But then he says, I believe he's saying to, the, to those who are still alive in verse 21, for behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will, go, uh, and will no longer cover her, her dead, her slain. And, and the bottom line is this, is that Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 4, he didn't just come up with that theology. And that theology wasn't, wasn't first initiated in the body of Messiah back in the early 1900s, like, like some people who teach that heretical teaching. They'll say, well, that's relatively new. No, it's not. It goes all the way back to the psalmist in, in 27. And Isaiah, the prophet, in, in Isaiah 26, um, he clarifies all of that. And he says, here's, what, here's what's going to happen. 
And now Paul comes along and he says, okay, listen, this is what they're talking about. For this we say by the word of the Lord, and that would be the, the word of the Lord at that time was the Torah and the prophets. Now the word of the Lord can come by the Spirit, but it will always line up with the law and the prophets. So whether he's talking about by the word of the Spirit of the, of the word or by the written word, he's talking about what has already been established in the law and the prophets. For this we say by the word, by the law and the prophets of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the, vo with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to, be, to, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. And so you have to understand that, that that's not a New Testament doctrine that just, that just popped up you know, around the first uh, of the, the early 1900s. That is a doctrine that was established in the book of Psalms, <laughs> confirmed in Isaiah, and then clarified in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. Now, he further clarifies in 1 Corinthians 15 what actually happens at that time. It's not just we're going to be caught up. Why are we caught up? Well, verse 50 of 1 Corinthians 15 says, now, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, you all know this scripture verse, at the last trump, that's the trump of God you hear, for the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on, the, must put on immortality. Remember, when Adam sinned, his immortal body became mortal flesh, like that. Can you imagine what that would be like? I want to go the other way. <laughs> I want my mortal body to be changed immortal in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? I can't, but I can't wait to find out. Amen? Verse 54, but when the perishable will have inherited the, the excuse me, but when, when this perishable will have put on imperishable and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall come the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. See, he and he's quoting now Isaiah 25, verse 8. <laughs> so even Isaiah 25, verse 8, is referring to the, to the change, to the, to the mystery where we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. O death, then he quotes Isaiah 13, verse 14. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So, so Paul is using four scripture verses in those two passages of scripture in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians 15 <laughs> to, to bring forth a, a fuller understanding of an Old Testament revelation into the New Testament. Hallelujah. We're going up, folks. It's just not going to be as soon as everybody thinks. It's going to be on the day that no man knows, <laughs> which is in and around the Feast of Yom Teruah the Feast of Trumpets. Now, Jesus talks about this when he says in, verse, in chapter 13 of Matthew, he says this, allow, allow, when, they, when, they, when, they, when he gave the parable of the, of the sower and the seed, remember the, the master sowed the, the good seed and then the enemy came along and sowed the bad seed and they started growing up together and the worker said, came to the master and said, should we pull up the weeds? And he said, no. Uh, verse 30, he says, no, he says, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And that's what we see right now, is that you've got the wicked getting more wicked every day, but the righteous are going to be walking more righteously every day. 
especially as we come into our understanding of the Torah and how to apply it in our lives. We're not going to be any more righteous, but we're going to walk in a greater degree of righteousness as we apply God's Torah in our life and walk it out. Does everybody understand that? We're saved by grace through faith, and now we need to walk as saved people, and the Torah helps us when we write the law of God on our hearts and on our minds. The Torah of God helps us to walk that out in life. Hallelujah. He says, allow both of them to grow up until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them and gather the wheat into my barns. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world, and, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all the stumbling blocks of, the, of, of his kingdom, all, all the stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, you say, well, Norm, that's all well and good, but that doesn't tell me where all this happens. Okay, well, let's find out. John tells us exactly when and where this happens. Revelation 14. <clears throat> This is on the day of the Lord. When he, or this is on the, the, the beginning of the wrath of God. This is when he pours out his wrath that we're not destined for. Revelation 14, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, that's Yeshua, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. That's when, that's when Yeshua reaps the church into his presence. That is, the ra that is the rapture of the church. And you can see, this, I, just, I like the picture, it says it gives us an idea. Verse 17 now, God turns his attention to the wicked. It says, and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. And he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has the power over fire, came out <clears throat> from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to, the, to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great wine press of, God, of God's wrath. We go into, then, the ten days of awe. That is when God pours his wrath out. That The second major event takes us to the ten days of awe. That is the, that is the rapture is the first uh, main event, uh, major event, and then the second event that happens simultaneously. Um... With the, with the rapture of the church, simultaneously the wrath of God is poured out. Or the wrath of God is poured out and the rapture takes place. place. It all takes place at the same time. And, and, and that is the rapture and the wrath on the day that no man knows. That's the day that you want to be prepared. So this is when the wrath of God, the ten days of awe, speak prophetically about the time when, the, when, the, when God pours out his final wrath judgment on repentant man. And you can see that right here in that scripture verse. He threw them, that, 
He took the he took the wheat and he reaped them into his presence, and he took the tares and he poured them into the wine press of God's wrath. That is talking about the wrath that we're not destined for. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I know every time that that I go back and and go through any of the teachings on the fall feast, whether it was last year or before, um, they always they always fill me afresh with expectation and just a confirmation of solidifying God's word in my life and and uh, but that's all the time we have for uh, today I'm just I'm just I'm just over time but there's so much to to get in in such a short period of time so I hope that bless you uh, Yom Tura is on Thursday which begins at 10 days of awe and then next Sabbath we'll discover what happens during those 10 days um, in the year Yeshua returns and how Yeshua fulfills it on the days of, um, of on the day of his return and that's so important that we get a handle on that because we know what to look for so that we aren't deceived when any Messiah comes and the strong delusion comes to 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 roll the church and to deceive the church and that's part of the great end time apostasy when the church, the majority of the church, leaves the faith for the strong delusion. And, and if we can understand this, when that happens, then the bottom line is we won't be deceived because the scripture is very clear. We know the, the times and the seasons of the Lord. We know how to recognize that time. And we're not going to be caught asleep like those who don't. Hallelujah. We're going to find out who the thief in the night is and when he comes um, next week. It's going to be exciting. So I want to encourage you to stay tuned so that you can stay on time um, with the Lord as he prepares to return for his people. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Shabbat Shalom.